the Bible says, and he was when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With man it is impossible but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. When we open it, Lord, when we read it, when we ponder it, it's so meaningful to us. We ask you now, Lord, though we've read this many times, Show us now what you have for us and give us wisdom, Lord, that we can apply it to our lives, thereby being better servants to bring you praise, honor, and glory. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading about these verses in a commentary. Uh, written by Warren Wiersbe. And uh, when he started uh, his little account on what was going on here, uh, the first thing he said was this was the only man that he could think of in the New Testament that came to Jesus truly seeking, truly looking, and left in worse shape than what he came to. And I got to thinking about that, and, and I got to thinking that's just not true. And, and we'll, we'll be looking at that in a minute. But let's take a look at this young man. Now, this account is also in Matthew's Gospel. It is also in Luke's Gospel. And if we put all the two Gospels together, we can get a really good picture of this man. Uh, Mark says that uh, Jesus was going forth and there came one running. He didn't want to let Jesus get away. He was running to Jesus. He was running. Maybe he'd heard about Jesus. Maybe he had seen the miracles. We don't know why. But he knew that this teacher, this, this person, was somebody different from anybody else that he had had any kind of dealings with. And he came running after this man. I have, I always want to believe the best about people. 
And I think this man was running because he was truly spiritually seeking how he could get closer to God. Now, we have to remember about this man. He was probably a, a young Jewish man. We say, wait, wait a minute, young? How do you know he was young? Well, Matthew's gospel tells us that he was young. And, and Luke tells us that he was a ruler, that he had a, had a position. So this was a successful man. He was a young man. Boy, wouldn't we like to, to have a little bit of our youth back sometime, especially during this cold weather when, when the weather's turned kind of cold. Y'all have bones that ache just a little bit more during this cold weather. I guess we all do that, don't we? This boy had everything going for him, and I call him a boy. I, I guess he was a man. They described him as a man. But uh, uh, we, we look at those, and he had youth. He had position. And most of all, he was seeking. He wasn't resting on his position, saying, hey, I'm a person of authority. He wasn't like the centurion who said, you know, I, I tell people to go and they go. I tell people to come and they come. He wasn't resting on any of that authority, but he was truly seeking. And he came to Jesus and he was seeking something for him because he knew that there's something in me that's lacking. There's something that's not right. Now, if he was a young Jewish boy, we have to remember that he was taught under the Old Testament. How, what was the Old Testament people taught? Well, they were given the law of Moses. They were said, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. If you do something out of error, if you do something that's wrong, you can take this sacrifice and you can go up to the temple and get the priest to offer this sacrifice for you and that'll bring remission of sins. Notice that word in there, remission of sins. All those sacrifices were never going to bring the forgiveness of sins. They were only going to bring remission of sins. That's what John the Baptist had preached. He, said, he preached to repent of your sins for the remission of sins. What happens when, when if, if you have a disease or something and it goes into remission? That means that the symptoms stop. But is that disease still in you? Very possibly that disease is still in you and it's just waiting to come up again. And, and that's the same way with sin in our lives. See, we have to understand what sin is. Sin is an attitude from within that rebels against God. Think about that. The Jewish people were taught that if they could just control their actions, if they could just follow the law, then they would be okay. And even if they broke the law, if they offered the proper sacrifice, it could be put right. There was a problem with that, though. They could not keep the law. Not all of it. We, we look at our lives today and we read the Ten Commandments, and I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm an exception to the rule, but I break them. And if I don't break them in deed, I break them in thought. I break them with that inner feeling that's down inside of me. <laughs> and I wish that didn't. And, and, and I try harder. And, and I come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. And I, I, I ask him to, to help me. Do better tomorrow than what I did today. But it seems like I have those weaknesses. And those weaknesses are ever before me. And, and I can't get through a day. It doesn't seem like without having to ask for forgiveness for something. This man comes up to Jesus. Remember, he was running. I'm not going to let him get away. He's here now. My opportunity is now. Boy, isn't that a lesson for all of us? <laughs> when, when, when we have an opportunity, let's not put it off till tomorrow. How many people here procrastinate about something? I do. I, 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 hey, why, why put off tomorrow what we can do today, huh? That's not what a lot of us say. A lot of times say, why, why, why do today what we can put off till tomorrow? 
you know, sometimes we, we just turn that around and we procrastinate. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't procrastinate about what God is calling you to do. If he's calling you for something, act on it then. Listen to what he's telling you. Do it then. This, this young man ran up to Jesus. And he had one question for him. Just one simple question. And he said, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He must have some kind of understanding about eternal life because he knew that he couldn't buy it. He couldn't purchase it. He was going to have to inherit it. And, and he said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, we can't buy eternal life, can we? We, we can't, can't do that. It's, we don't have enough money, and it's not for sale. But we can inherit it. How can we inherit it? By being adopted into God's family. By, by having Jesus pay the price, pay our debt on that old cross and accept it. And therefore, we can cry out, Abba, Father. We can pray that prayer that Jesus did, our Father who art in heaven. He can be our Father. And what can we inherit from him? We can't buy it from him, but we can inherit it from him. And that is eternal life. And so Jesus could have said to him, the only way you can inherit it is to make him your father. And then that he probably would have been asking, well, how do I do that? But Jesus, knowing the heart of all men, said unto him, first off, he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that's God. Jewish rabbis at the time, they wouldn't allow people to call them good. They thought that God was the only one that was good. And, and if we think about that, isn't that true today too? We, we all have faults. We all have something in us that's not good, but God doesn't have any of those. And Jesus, he was not here denying that he was God, but he was saying to this young man, do you know what you're saying? You just called me good. What's the one thing that we have to do to inherit eternal salvation? We have to believe in Jesus. Believe what about Jesus? Believe that he came from heaven, that he was God in the flesh, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life. <coughs> Pardon me. That he died on the cross to pay for yours and my sins and that he rose again on the third day. That he made himself known to his disciples and that after 40 days he ascended back up to heaven and he's sitting in heaven now on the right hand of the Father making intercessions for each and every one of us. And I need that. I, I, I need him to make intercessions for me. And I also need him to lead me and to guide me. There's none good but one, and that's Jesus. And, and even though he said to him, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. He did the right thing in calling him good. He did the right thing because he is good, and he is God. And he wanted this young man to know, to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was God. Jesus said to him, thou knowest the commandments. What was the teaching of the day? The teaching was the Ten Commandments. That's what God had made known. They, they said, follow these Ten Commandments. Uh, he didn't list them all, but he said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. Covers a lot of them, doesn't it? covers a lot of those commandments and, and he said uh, the young man answered him he said, and he answered and said unto him master all these have I observed from my youth oh my here I am having trouble just getting through a day 
And here's a young man that had observed all these things from his youth. I don't know, but I'm kind of thinking that this young man wasn't in touch with himself as much as he should have been. He wasn't seeing himself clearly. We look at the law, and what was the law supposed to be? Because we can't keep it. We never could keep it. And, and God knew that we couldn't keep it. But the law was supposed to be a mirror to show us how sinful we are. The law is God's character. He can keep each and every one of those perfectly. But we can't. We can't keep them. It was only a mirror to show us what we lacked. But there's one thing about a mirror. It could show us what we lacked, but it can't clean us. If, if, if I look bad in the mirror, if I've got a big smudge along my face here, and I get up and look in the mirror and I say, oh Lord, Look at that. I'm going to have to do something about that. And then I walk away and I have my cup of coffee and maybe I eat a piece of toast or an English muffin or something. And then I come back and look in the mirror again. And guess what? That smudge is still there. It ain't going to go away. It's still there. And it's not going to go away until I clean it and wash it off. I have to do something. And this man had the right start. Because he came what? Running to Jesus. And he kneeled down at Jesus, it says. And he said, what must I do? And then when Jesus told him, he said, well, I'm doing all that. I'm doing all that. I must not lack anything. Then why do I feel this way? Then why do I feel this way? Why do I feel that there's something not right inside of me? And he answered and said, Master, I have observed all these from my youth. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Imagine a person that, that thinks he's, he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing from his youth up. And he tells Jesus that. And Jesus looked at him. And what does he say? He loved him. Jesus beheld him and he loved him. I think even in our, in our faults and in our downward trends and in our mistakes, we can always count on one thing. We can always count on Jesus loving us. And he loved us. Even while we were enemies, Paul wrote to the Romans, Jesus loved us and he died for us. Jesus was going to get to the heart of the matter right now because everything that's, everything that's, that's wrong with us is, is a heart problem. It's not, not anything else. And Jesus beheld in him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. One thing. Go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me Jesus said to him one thing thou lackest all these things that you have and, and you notice weren't what Jesus didn't mention in those commandments he left out the tenth one what does the tenth one say? Thou shalt not covet. What does covetous mean? Covetous means that you're never satisfied. You have an appetite and you want more and more and more. Whether it's possessions, whether it's, it's whatever it is in your life, because we all could have something different. But when we covet something, we want more of it. And, and we work for that. Covetousness is, it, it, it can lead you into every other sin that they talk about in the commandments. 
every other sin. And, and this was the sin that this one man was having to deal with. What did Jesus tell him to do? You gotta, you gotta downsize, man. You gotta, you gotta downsize. Sell everything that you have and give to the poor. That was gonna be a hardship right there. You know, we don't like to downsize. We, we, we've spent our lives trying to build up things sometimes. We spend our whole lives trying to, to maybe get a little more land or maybe get a, a, a better car or maybe get, get a better type of lifestyle. Or maybe, we, we don't like to turn loose of things, do we? We don't turn loose of them at all. They're, they're ours and we've worked for them and we don't want, we don't want to turn loose of them. But sometimes... They have to. One thing I'm going to tell you about money. Money can be a wonderful servant, but it can be a terrible master. And when we covet money, when we, when we look to it for the things that, that we want and we're not looking to God for those things anymore, what's that going to do to us? Anything that takes our eyes off of God, that's an idol. Anything that we think is more valuable than God, that's an idol. There's, in, in Mark's, Mark's uh, uh, account of, of, of this young man, he, he's got a statement in here by Jesus that you're not going to find in, in Matthew's account and in Luke's account. And, and, and it's in that 24th verse. Uh, he told this man, this this man went away grieved. He wasn't willing to sell what he had. He wasn't willing to give up what he had. Boy, we see that so much in the world today, don't we? He, he, he wasn't to do any of that. And he said he went away grieved for he had great possessions. Jesus made the statement, you know, uh, how hardly uh, shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Uh, back then, riches... If, if you were doing what God wanted you to do, the people believed that he would bless you, that, that, that he would prosper you. That's what they had told the Israelites, hadn't they? He, he said, if you'll obey me, if, if you'll keep my commands, I'll bless you. And you'll live long in the land. And, and that's, what they were, that's what they were looking at. What, what, what happened to Job? Job was a righteous man. There was none like him. And God blessed him for that. But what did the people say when, when Job began to lose everything? We know that Job lost everything because of the devil. And, and actually because he was so righteous that God was bragging on him and said, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, yeah, I, I, I could break him. I, I could break him. Just, just give me a chance. God said, go, try it. You'll see. Job lost everything because he was so righteous. And he still kept his righteousness and didn't speak out against God. But the people said, what did his friends say? Job, you've got a, you've got a hidden sin in your life. There's, there's something not right here. Somebody who, who doesn't have a lot of stuff they must have a bad life. But somebody who has a lot of stuff, they must be living a good life. That's not necessarily so. Not necessarily so at all. And we know that today. But this, this young man, he didn't know that. And he went away grieved. I'm not going to give up what I've worked all my life for. Look at that 24th verse. Jesus said, you know, it's going to be hard for a rich man to enter in. It says, and the disciples were astonished at his words. Why were the disciples astonished? Because they believed the same thing that this man was. That possessions was a blessing. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, children, how hard it is for them that what? Trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. How hard it is for them to trust in riches. Trust in our money. 
I'm going to tell you something about money. Money will promise you everything that God will promise you. It, if you got enough money, you'll have peace. If you got enough money, even if you get sick, you can get the best doctors and, and, and you'll have health. If, if you have money and there's a financial collapse around, you'll still, you, if you got enough money, you can get through it. You'll be able, you'll, you'll never be hungry because you'll have money to buy stuff. Money will promise you everything that God will promise you, but the problem with money is it can't deliver. Money, money can buy you a house, but it can't give you a home. Money can buy you a bed, but it can't give you a good night's sleep. Money can buy you the best doctors in the world, but it cannot give you health. Those things can only come from God. And when we trust money instead of God, we're on a very, very slippery slope. Why did God only give them manna for one day in the wilderness? Except on, on Friday when he gave them double portion. So it would, cover, it would cover Saturday too, which was the Sabbath day. Why did he only do that? Why did they have to go out and gather it each and every day? To teach them that each and every day God was going to provide for them. It wasn't going to be their money. Don't trust in your riches. Trust in God. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, what did he say? Give us this day our daily bread. <coughs> daily bread. One day at a time. I'm going to tell you, Money can be a wonderful servant. Money can help you, you do things. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with money. But there is something wrong with the root or with the love of money because it has the root of many evils in it. We need to be looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher and if he's the author and the finisher can he not supply for us each and every day there's people in Ukraine right now who maybe don't know whether they're going to sleep that night maybe they don't know if there's going to be any heat where they finally bed down that night maybe they don't know if I lay down and go to sleep here I don't know whether this building is going to be bombed we had a thing in our devotional this morning that it brought up. Abraham Lincoln, what did he say? He said, I was forced to go to my knees because I had no other place to go. Money's not another place to go. We can't go there. The place that we should be going to is God. So the question for today has got to be what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the Lord? Is he the author and the finisher in your life? Now, I'm not going to say. I, I've got a savings account. You probably all have a savings account. The Bible says that it's good to save. And we're probably never, never going to be asked to do what this young ruler was doing. Because what did Jesus say to him? Sell everything that you have and give the money to the poor. I'm glad he's not told me that. And I don't think he's going to tell most people that but if money is controlling us if our trust is in money or our possessions then it's going to cause a stumbling block between us and God 
And that's a stumbling block that we don't need to put there. Remember who provides us with everything that we have. Remember that God is the one that gives us the ability to acquire wealth. It all comes from him. I, as I was studying this, I got to thinking, Jesus told him to sell everything he had. <coughs> this man went away grieved, sorrowful, troubled, however you want to define it. But suppose he had obeyed. Suppose he sold everything he had and gave it all, all away and started following Jesus. You know, God could give everything that he sold back to him. Didn't he do that with Job? Didn't everything that the devil took, God gave him back double. Gave him back double on everything. Could not have God done this for this man if he had only obeyed. I don't know where God's leading you here this morning. I don't, I don't know anybody's heart. I think people that claim to know people's heart and claim to know that, they're just... I don't know. I won't say that. But we have to ask ourselves, what are we trusting? And if it's not the Lord, then let's do some checking up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.